All right, this is Mr. Peterson with another screencast for AP Environmental Science. Today, we're learning about geology, soil, and mineral production, just like the gold that has been extracted from this mine. So let's dig our way into this chapter. First up in your notes is geology, or the study of all the processes that occur on the Earth's surface and interior. There are three major parts that make up the structure of the Earth, and they are the crust, the mantle, and the core. The crust is the thinnest and outermost section, and it's usually between 3 and 30 miles thick. Next is the mantle, which is a much thicker layer, followed by the innermost layer of the core. I like to think that think of this as the universe's biggest jawbreaker, where when you get one layer off, there's another different layer, followed by another, until you finally get to the core. Parts of the Earth's crust are divided up into tectonic plates, and those plates literally float on top of the molten or liquid parts of the mantle. The movement of molten rock in the mantle moves the tectonic plates around, and that causes lots of interesting geological effects. Where plates run into each other, which is part of the Earth's crust, is built up into mountains. Where plates move apart, volcanoes are common. Areas around the edge of the Pacific plate are well known for the amount of volcanic activity they produce. Where places slide against each other, earthquakes are frequent. That's why California has many more earthquakes than we do here in South Georgia. So all of these types of things are internal geological processes, and they're named that because they are driven by forces from inside of the Earth. By looking at a global distribution of plate boundaries like this, we can determine the location of volcanoes, island arcs, earthquakes, hotspots, and faults. On the other hand, external geological forces are things that are driven by factors outside of the Earth. A major example of this is weathering, where rock materials can be broken down into smaller pieces by plant roots, running water, and freezing thawing. Now, the types of boundaries we look at are convergent boundaries, which can result in the creation of mountains, island arcs, earthquakes, and volcanoes. Divergent boundaries can result in seafloor spreading, rift valleys, volcanoes, and earthquakes. And then transform boundaries, which can result in earthquakes. So convergent run into each other, divergent move apart, and transform slide past one another. Another big factor in the geography of Earth is erosion. This is where material is moved from one part of the Earth's surface to another. Like when the wind and moving water moving through this canyon carved out this beautiful scene. Let's go back to volcanoes. Volcanoes are areas where magma from the Earth's mantle has reached the Earth's surface. Volcanoes have played a major role in the, in the Earth's climate. As the smoke and ash they add to the atmosphere can actually help moderate Earth's climate. Some of the ash is so fine that it stays suspended in the air for years, help to, helping to reflect sunlight and keep the Earth cool. Periods of above average volca volcanism are linked with cooling global temperatures. In the period of around 65 million years ago, when the dinosaurs went extinct, was a period of above average volcano activity. Earthquakes occur when tectonic plates slide past each other, get, but get caught against each other, building up stress that gets released in one large burst. This image, of, this image of the San Andreas Fault in the western U.S. shows the relative movement of each plate. And you can see from the color scale that the maximum movement we're talking about is about 20 millimeters per year, or 2 centimeters per year. It doesn't seem like much, but it adds up over time. Earthquakes occur when stress overcomes a locked fault, releasing stored energy. Here's a picture of a sidewalk that straddles the San Andreas Fault as it runs through a neighborhood. When the sidewalk was built, it was straight. Now, many years later, it's shifted as each plate moves 20 millimeters apart each year. Tsunamis are ocean waves generated from earthquakes that occur on the ocean floor when part of the Earth's crust moves up or down. The movement of Earth's crust may be measured in a few inches for the actual event, but as that moving inch of water gets into shallower and shallower water, the height of the wave goes from inches to the height of buildings as it crashes ashore. This picture of the after effect of a tsunami shows the destructive power of a wall of water. It look, I had to look very hard for good pictures to make these screen tests, but I couldn't find any actual pictures of tsunami in progress. I attribute it to the thought that most people facing an oncoming tsunami are more concerned for their lives than taking a picture, picking a filter to make it look best, and then uploading it to the internet. Another geological process is the landslide, or mass wasting. 
This occurs when huge parts of a hill or mountain come loose in one gigantic flood of soil, rock, and mud. Now a bit more about Earth's geology. The, path, the last parts of the chapter are concerned with non-renewable minerals. So, what exactly is a mineral? Minerals are elements or inorganic compounds that occur in the Earth's crust as a solid with a crystalline structure. Some minerals are a substance we want directly, like gold, sodium chloride, or sulfur. But many minerals are combined with other minerals to form rocks. These are, there are three kinds of rocks. Sedimentary rock is made up of fine particles of rock that have been weathered, eroded, and deposited by wind or water. As time goes by, the newer layers on top squeeze on the lower layers, compressing them into solid rock. Igneous rock is formed when magma cools and solidifies. Metamorphic rock forms when igneous or sedimentary rocks are reheated or subjected to high pressures, causing them to change their composition. All of these changes take place over periods of millions of years in the rock cycle, where new rocks are continually being generated as old ones are sort of broken down and recycled. The Earth's crust contains all of the minerals that we use for things in our lives, but because it takes millions of years to create new rock material, all of those minerals are going to be non-renewable. Moving on to those minerals, a mineral resource is a concentration of material that can be extracted and processed into useful materials at a reasonable cost. There are minerals that are buried so deep underground or so far under the ocean that the cost of extracting them make them practically unusable. Mineral resources come in three types, fossil fuels, like coal, metallic minerals, like gold, from this mine in the picture, copper, and aluminum, and then non-metallic minerals, like sand and gravel. As I said a minute ago, all of these materials are non-renewable because the process that formed them took so long that in human time, we've got all that we're going to ever get. Next up is ore. Ore is any rock that contains a useful mineral in a high enough concentration to make it profitable to dig. This is bauxite ore, and it's the type of rock that contains aluminum in high concentration. Every soft drink you've ever seen contains aluminum. That originally came from a rock that looked like this. High grade ore contains a large amount of the desired mineral, so low grade ores contain a smaller amount. High grade ore resources are usually extracted first because it's much more cost effective. By this point in human history, geologists from every country have determined estimates of how much each mineral resource exists. Those estimates are of the reserves, and they're called that because they are resources that have to yet to be extracted. Estimates have changed over time as newer techniques have led to identifying new reserves, and a newer technology has allowed previously inaccessible reserves to be extracted. But no matter how you estimate it or what tools and techniques you are to use, there is a fixed quantity of each mineral resource on Earth. We're limited to what we have here. There are many examples of mineral resources in your notes. I've mentioned the first one, aluminum, as being important for soft drink cans, and now I'll tell you that aluminum is also an important building material. For a while, it was used as the electric electrical conductor and wiring, but that was a disaster. So now wires are made of copper, but you need to read through the book and find what each of the other mineral resources is used for. There are many advantages and disadvantages to mineral use. First up, mineral resources are incredibly valuable for the country they're found in. Mineral resources bring money into a country by furnishing the raw materials for many industrial products that will be sold to other countries. And they also help create jobs as the minerals are extracted by these miners, processed, and used in industry. The disadvantages are numerous because the process of mining, processing, and refining the mineral, minerals is very hard on the environment. There are two big ways to remove mineral deposits from the earth so that we can be used. First up is surface mining, which is sort of a top-down approach. The rock material that covers the desired deposit of minerals is called overburden. And it is removed and dumped off site and is called the spoils when it is removed. Tailings are another form of spoils, 
a rock that previously contained minerals is left behind on the surface after removing the minerals from it. Subsurface mining is a bottom-up approach where shafts are dug underground to extract mineral resources. The path of the mine follows the deposits as they run underground and the overlaying material is left in place. There are many harmful effects of mining and extracting minerals. First, surface mining completely removes whatever natural ecosystem was in place before the mine was constructed. Second, the mining spoils lack topsoil, so new plants have a hard time getting established in areas where the tailings are dumped. Third, chemicals that the tailings contain are easily washed out by rain and find their, ways, their way into rivers, streams, and lakes. Those chemicals may not have been big problems when they were underground, but when released in huge quantities above ground, they can cause environmental havoc. Last up, the process of extracting the mineral from the ore it's contained in is called smelting. Smelting occurs when ore is heated and chemicals are added to release the minerals. This can result in massive amounts of air and water pollution as some of those chemicals are released into the environment. As things like coal reserves get smaller, it becomes necessary to mine coal through subsurface mining, which is very expensive. Plus, as more reserves are depleted, we must also access lower grade ores, which leads to more pollution when using them. Now, if all mineral resources are by definition non-renewable, how long will the supplies we have last? I like to think that the answer is long enough because when we've used up enough of it that prices start to rise, we as a society will shift and find alternatives or start seriously recycling what we have in order to make it they last forever. There won't be a day where there suddenly is no more iron to make steel, but there will be a day when we have many alternatives to steel and the steel from cars and old buildings will be recycled much, much more than it is today. Now I have a world map up here because of the idea of mineral distribution. Different areas of the world have different amounts of these resources, so minerals are distributed unevenly over the surface of the earth. Some countries have a more complete set of resources, others are heavily dependent on trading with mineral-rich countries. Economic depletion occurs when a mineral costs more to find, extract, transport, and process any remaining resource than it's actually worth. After economic depletion, there are five alternatives to use using new minerals. First, reuse and recycle existing supplies, then waste less, then use less, substitute it, or you just do without it. Substitutes are a great way to reduce current levels of consumption of some mineral resources. This copper plumbing used to be very common in all types of buildings, but as copper resources have been overused in recent decades and the price of copper has increased dramatically, it's been replaced by PVC or plastic tubing. Now, the oil used to make this plastic is also non-renewable, but let's save that for a later chapter. The U.S. government stopped minting all copper pennies in 1982, and since then, they're made of mostly zinc with a light copper coating. It's funny that if you have a penny minted before 1982, it's actually worth about 2.5 cents for the copper it contains. It's a pretty safe way to double your money as people actually go to the bank and purchase large amounts of pennies, sort through them, and keep all of the copper ones, and return all the later ones, and repeat the process. They're keeping all of the copper ones, and one day, when the price of copper skyrockets, they'll trade all of those pennies to a copper recycler. Now, melting down that copper is defacing U.S. currency, which isn't, isn't exactly legal, but it's kind of an interesting idea to make a little money. Replacements for copper wiring, like this ancient telephone trunk line, have also been developed, such as modern fiber optic cables, which have been developed and used. Now, that's made out of plastic too, which is also non-renewable. So in the recycling and reusing department, we can greatly extend the time we have left with most mineral resources simply by recycling them or reusing them before they have to be recycled. The financial and environmental cost of recycling something like aluminum cans is tiny when compared to the cost of extracting raw materials from the earth and processing them into new aluminum. And it's a process that can continue indefinitely. The going rate for aluminum in 2023, a single aluminum can is worth between 5 and 10 cents for the metal it contains. So not recycling a whole 12 pack is like throwing away between 50 cents and a dollar. It's not going to send children to college, but I have a huge trash can filled with crushed cans. And it's nice to take it to a recycler once a year and, you know, get, you know, 50, 75 dollars back, depending on the actual price. 
Jumping back to soil, I want to touch on it one more time. Soils are formed when parent materials weathered, transported, and deposited. Soils are generally categorized by horizons based on their composition and organic material, and soils can be eroded by winds or humans. So protecting soil can protect water quality as solids effectively filter clean water that moves through them, which is why we as humans get most of our drinking water from groundwater. Just about the last thing here is reading this soil triangle. Soil texture triangle that allows us to identify and compare soil types based on the percentage of clay, silt, and sand. This is something you need to be familiar with and understand how to read. We will talk about this more in class, but soil is important. Some important soil characteristics are how much water the soil can hold, which varies based on type. Particle size and composition of each soil horizon can affect the porosity permeability, and fertility of the soil. Modern techniques allow us to test soils for chemical, physical, and biological properties to aid in a variety of decisions, such as how much irrigation is needed and how much fertilizer we need to add. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching.